what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by the 2019 Foot Candle Film Festival. This year's film festival will be held September 27th through 29th in Hickory, North Carolina. Learn more by visiting footcandlefilmfestival.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Welcome to Foot Candle Films. This is the podcast on TheMesh.tv, where Chris Fry and Alan Jackson, the two of us here, talk movies. Uh, Chris and I are both co-founders and co-directors of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival, an annual festival coming up this September, but... We also like to watch movies and talk about movies and all that free time as well. So, Chris, what we're going to be doing today, welcome, by the way, Chris. Thank you. I forgot to say welcome. (laughs) Welcome. Uh, Glad to have you here, as always. Good to be here. My co-host on the show. We are typical format of the show, and we're going to follow right along with that format today as well, is we will be reviewing a couple of new release films. The two films we'll be discussing today are going to be Spider-Man Far From Home, the latest Marvel Cinematic Universe slash kind of hybrid Sony stuff. We'll get into all that one during the review. But then we'll also be talking about the latest uh, horror film, although we may that term may be up for debate. Uh, <laughs> Midsummer by Ari Aster, uh, director of uh, Hereditary. Uh, Hereditary from yeah. a couple of years ago. Or maybe last year. It was, was just, it last just last year, year? actually. Wow. Yeah. Okay. These are knocked out pretty close. Yes. Then we'll be moving on to some movie news, and we'll also be ending the show with recommendations that Chris and I like to share with you. These will be recommendations of films that we think are worth revisiting, finding online, or just something to catch up with if uh, you're looking for something to, for some little entertainment for a couple of hours. So Chris, I think it's time to go ahead and get started with our first review. If that sounds good to you. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, this is Spider-Man Far From Home. You're a very difficult person to contact, Spider-Man. This is Mr. Beck. Who could have used someone like you on my world? New world? Beck is from Earth, just not ours. The snap to our hole in our dimension. You're saying there's a multiverse? We have a job to do, and you're coming with us. There's got to be someone else you can use. What about Thor? Off-world. Captain Marvel. Unavailable. But I'm just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. With Spider-Man Far From Home, Tom Holland has now slung webs in five movies. I'm counting Civil War. This is kind of the first one. Sure. What did you make of this film coming on the heels of Avengers Endgame? Are you ready to take a European vacation in an attempt to forget the MCU? Or is your newly renamed Spidey Sense, now known as the Peter Tingle, going crazy for more adventures of our friendly neighborhood, Avenger? All right. So this one is, is, is going to be tricky for me to review. Oh, because the, okay. I'm reviewing it or I'm looking at it from three perspectives. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I even took notes on them, just like so three keep perspectives. It all straight. So there's the part of me that wants to review it as just an overall film, like a film critic, okay. putting aside any of my own personal history with the character or any of its relationship in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Just is it a good film? Gotcha. There's the second view, which is how does it fit? Kind of in your question, how does it fit in the whole as a follow up to the Marvel, the Endgame, Avengers, all the big. MCU machine and is this a good worthy entry and does it kind of make you want to continue going in this universe or does it kind of want to make you sick of it? That's the second side. And then there's the third part of it, which is I'm a big Spider-Man fan. So I've always been probably a lot more critical of any attempts to bring Spider-Man to the big screen. Uh, I have a long history with the character, big fan read for a long time and so you know you're taking something very personal to me and putting it up on the big screen gotcha so it's a little three different ways to review this so so this is going to be like a four hour review yeah yeah go ahead and fix a fix a drink (laughs) settle in this is going to be a long one no i'll I'll try to keep it fairly succinct on all three but uh let me go ahead and tackle one first which is as a film okay generally as a film as a film 
I thought this was a very fun movie. Fun is the word I'm going to use for this this review. Um, is it perfect? No. Does it have some issues? Sure. But overall, I think the sense of fun is what I really enjoyed with this film and, and made it work. Um, as you mentioned, this takes place in the heels of the Avengers Endgame, all that drama and everything else. So we're taking... Now we're following Peter Parker, who's still a high school student, as he and his classmates go on a European trip. Why are they going on a European field trip just a short time after the destruction of half the universe and all? Or or, or the blip. The blip. blip. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you could argue all that and get nitpicky on it, but fine. They're on a European vacation. Let's just go with that. And I think it's a fun premise. Um, This movie had a lot of great twists and turns that we may talk about in a spoiler time later in the review that I thought kept it interesting. I will say the first half of the film, I was a little worried. I thought the film was pretty rocky the first half, and I don't think it really worked um, from a storytelling standpoint. But there's a point in the film, maybe we'll discuss it in spoilers, where I think the film really got good. And I think the second half of the film made up for the shortcomings in the first half, where overall I walked away from the film feeling like it was a really fun, enjoyable experience that did enough to build up this this character and the future that they have plotted for it. So that's my, okay. as a film on its own merit, I say it's a fun film. Weak first half, little worried first half, but second half was really strong, mainly due to a Mr. Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. I think Tom Holland was still strong all the way through. I just think the story was really weak in the first half until they figured out what they wanted to do in that latter half of the film, which you could say it was all building to the second half. So in hindsight, maybe the first half worked okay, but in watching it in your first experience, um, it was a film of two parts. And I think the second part really won out for me. So before I go on to my other thoughts, let me get your sure. feedback just from a, you are not as big a I'm, Spider-Man I'm fan. I am not you're as not, invested. You know, you're True. not as invested. No. And you also have not been as ardent a supporter of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as I have. True. So I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on this film now. And, you know, in discussing the MCU, I tend to be overall more favorable on the standalone films as opposed to the group films, the Avenger films. Okay. The isolated hero films I tend to be higher on. And that's kind of the case with this one. I, I liked it. Um, I remember liking Homecoming, the previous standalone mm-hmm. Spider-Man film with Tom Holland. I remember liking that one a lot. This one, not as smooth mm. as that one, but it didn't didn't mean that I didn't like it and didn't take away. You know, it was it'd be hard to like come out and do another Homecoming and make it exactly the same. And if it was, it'd probably be boring. Um, but I, I did like it. I will say I was caught off guard by the very first scene, yeah. and it is. It is a joke, and mm-hmm. I will not ruin it for people. But I'd, I'd, you know, Spider Man in general, and you'll have to tell me if this is the case in the comics, which I think, from what I understand, it is. It has kind of a jokey mentality, for and most, home yeah. and Homecoming had that. You know, it has mm-hmm. it's still an action movie with superhero, you know, just doing things. But Peter Parker kind of has a sense of humor. He's kind of a little bit of a nerd. He's kind of mm-hmm. clumsy sometimes. The joke that start just the fact that this movie started off with a joke. And the the type of thing it was mocking <laughs> um, kind of took me off guard because mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, wait a second. I thought we were kind of done with something it's talking about. And it start, but it addresses it kind of addresses the blip and addresses in game yeah. immediately. And it just really, really took me off guard <laughs> and kind of made me like fumble to switch gears a little bit. But then once the film kind of put that behind it and got going, I was like, oh. Okay, you know, it was, it was an interesting. It was not how I was expecting them to start the film, <laughs> but yeah. um, I thought it was an interesting way to do it. I and will, I will say, say, I will say on that note before you go on, I, I agree. I liked the direction dare, they took. Daring. It was daring. Yeah, I almost took it as having fun with this whole premise that I could almost imagine the filmmakers already had this film planned. They knew what they wanted to do with this film. The whole Avengers thing kind of happened and they're like, okay, we've got to weave this in. It's a really depressing subject and it's a really tough subject to, uh, to weave into our story. Let's just have fun with it for the first couple minutes of the film. And then we don't have to deal with it again. That's almost the impression I got is like, let's just take, let's just put a bow on it. We're going to kind of have a fun moment with it. 
And now we don't really have to spend a whole lot of time dealing with it the rest of the film. That's the impression I got from it, and, and yeah. I liked it. I, I thought that was I, it. Still, it, there's it. It doesn't clean up all the issues that the whole blip or snap or whatever caused in the universe. <laughs> I still, still think there's a lot of issues that Marvel may have to con- deal with in future films. But I like the fact that they just said, you know what, we're just gonna we're just gonna bow it up here and have a little fun joke about it, and now we're gonna move on. So, and I, yeah, so I thought it was an interesting way to start the film. Ultimately, I did like it. Just kind of caught me off guard. I liked several different things, but the I, the opening part, some of the the action sequences in the first half of the film yeah, that you're describing, a little dodgy with the elementals. Well, yeah. I'll just go ahead and throw them out there. Um, we're a little yeah. we're a little rough, but I will say, in a way, I think that can be excused mm-hmm. by some things that happen in the second half of the film. I so it all kind agree. of that's why I think together. the first half didn't work for me as I was watching it. But then by the second half, when some things are revealed and you understand, it actually does make you go backwards and think, oh, OK, well, maybe that's why some of this was maybe didn't work as well as it should have when you were watching it. Sure. It does make a little more sense. And I, I think you're on the same page. That first half, I thought the first half was got almost way too jokey at times. I think the the humor was almost I, I over liked, the top. I liked Night Monkey. No, that was that was great. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the night, but it's just the other supporting characters, the teachers. Mm. It was just a little much at times. I thought the teachers that are chaperoning the trip. Yeah, um, yeah they they were a little. It was almost a little cartoonish. They a were a little too much. much. Yeah. And uh, I could have done with a not quite that extreme level of, of of comedy going all the way through. But again, when the film hits its stride, which is about. Uh, about a halfway, close to halfway point. Right. I think it really goes into a high gear, and I've loved everything about the latter half of this film. So, And I, you mentioned Jake Gyllenhaal being a big reason why... He plays Mysterio. Mysterio, an yeah. Interesting new character that we meet very early on, uh, you know, in the film as a, as a hero helping stop these elementals that are destroying different cities in Europe. Right, and his, his character arc was really interesting to me and how they used from what I understand, how he was based in the comics and how they kind of bring that in here and adjust it. Or, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting. I will say too, that the sequences with Mysterio in the latter half of the film, from what I do vaguely remember of him being in the comics, I thought were like dead on to how he was portrayed. And it was really neat. That was kind of like a, you know, a nerd joy moment when I was like, Oh, I remember those scenes. And it was like, they'd actually taken panels from the comic book and redone them on a big screen. That was really, I I will say, and even though I'm never a fan of overdoing CGI, I will say in this sense, it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. And I would say it's, it was probably one of the best sequences I've seen in any of the Marvel movies Hmm. of all time. It was enjoyable. It totally worked from both a nostalgia standpoint I can actually pinpoint the issue from 1960s where <laughs> they got pulled from, and it was perfect. Okay. And I can't remember seeing anything that visually exciting in the other films that have been made in this whole Marvel universe. So I loved it. That was my absolute favorite part of the film, and it totally worked. And yes, that was great. I think by that point, I had bought into the film so completely. I'm like, yep, you got me. I'm gotcha. good for the rest of the film. I can excuse some of the stuff that seemed clunky in that first 30, 45 minutes or so because this nailed it and I'm now solid for the rest of the way. Yeah. And Tom Holland and Zendaya as Peter Parker, Mm Spider-Man slash MJ. I like them. I think, I think they're great. Um, It was a very believable high school romance, you know? And I was wondering kind of while we were going on with the film, especially kind of at the end, how it ends up. Help me remember, because I do not remember from homecoming. Mm Mm-hmm. Zendaya was the daughter of no. no. Okay, she's completely different. She's from, completely separate character. She was in Homecoming. She was in Homecoming. Small though. part in Homecoming. Okay. Didn't have a lot to do, but she was a classmate. Uh, Liz was the one that part that Peter Parker was, was interested in in Homecoming. Okay. Went to the the dance with right. Was a daughter. Yeah. Okay. Um, but she moved away when her father was right. you know, arrested. Okay. And all. Okay. okay. So, but the end of the movie, there's a little flirting between Peter and and MJ. MJ, which okay. is Michelle, not Mary Jane, but she goes by MJ, which is kind of a gotcha. a nice little nod to sure. the classic story. Well, that, that's what I was. I figured I must have had the characters kind of 
merged and confused because yeah. I figured they would have at least referenced somehow if that was the case that she was the same. Okay, but she I got you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Good. To no, I thought it, it was a great, great, a great uh, relationship between the two of them. It was awkward. It was exactly what you would expect from two high schoolers. I like the take they're putting on MJ as far as being uh, uh, more you know, sarcastic and darker and all. But yet you also see a real true person in there too and mm-hmm. so much of it she's trying to trying to mask sure which i think is an interesting thing that maybe get opened up in future storylines too true um so no i, I agree i had them down as one of the strengths i think their relationship their romance was was great and you know and i mentioned the whole dreamlike sequence in the middle of the film that I thought sure. was, was great almost perfect even the action scenes in the last portion of the film which Again, we're heavily CGI. They kind of mm-hmm. have to be for some of the stuff that was going on. But I thought we're really good. I actually I, thought we're pretty I exciting. I think the whole ending sequence, I think it happens in London Bridge or uh, in the bridge area there sure. in London. Was Skyline great. area. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Uh, I actually thought I didn't mind the over-reliance on CGI. They made it work. They, it felt still very tactile and very real. And I love the way it ended up kind of on that, that bridge tower sequence. And uh, yeah, so I thought, again... I have almost zero fault with the second half of this film. Once a shift in the story happens, Mm -hmm. everything beyond that point, I'm perfectly happy with. It's just, I wish I almost just felt like they were trying to figure out how to keep the audience away from what they were going to twist and turn so much in that first half that it just didn't work as a really great storyline in that first half. Hmm. But then you go backwards and say, okay, well, maybe that's because they were trying to keep all this stuff from you and they were trying to make you think this way and then they sure. were going to change it up. So in the end, it kind of resolved itself and redeemed itself a little bit for me. Yeah, having seen the film only once, I wonder if on a second viewing, my estimation of it would improve. I like the film, but would it improve because you kind of know yeah. certain beats that are going to happen and it would – I don't know, it would flow better on a second Possibly, viewing? Possibly, yeah. I'm curious if that would be the case. I will say I like this better than Homecoming. Okay. This worked for me better. Okay. Um, I thought I liked Homecoming a lot. I think Homecoming, I was still trying to struggle with just what they were doing with this Spider-Man character and kind of some new iterations of it. And I also thought the action sequences were not great in Homecoming. I just don't, I can't even remember any of the action <laughs> sequences in Homecoming. Okay. Where this one had not only that really visually exciting sequence in the middle, but had a great ending sequence. So, and I, th- I, I like the villains in both. All right. I'll go ahead and say like, sure. you know, without going into much more detail, I really like the villains in both of the two movies. I think okay. they are nailing the villains for all those superhero movies that are doing. I think, these two movies are getting it right. Okay. Um, and uh, so I did like it better. Mysterio is a character that was always been my favorite growing up. So there's probably a little personal connection there. Sure. So I will say just to kind of quickly hit, you know, we already talked a little bit, my feeling about this in the whole Marvel cinematic universe. I think it was a great thing to cap off after in uh, end game to be light to kind of make a little fun of some of the things that from, from the end game movie right. to put a light spin on it. And it doesn't solve the problems that in game created, but I do feel like it gave it the right spin. And I think for at least now, all that stuff's kind of put to rest and we can move forward onto some new things. Then as a personal thing with the Spider-Man character, I'm still wrestling with how this Spider-Man is compared to all the ones I've grown up with. It's <laughs> still been quite a few. Yeah, there have been. And, you know, I have my own give and takes on all of them. The only thing that I, and this is a very personal nitpicky thing that does not uh, change my view of it as a film on its own, is this is, this character is facing the same problem I think a lot of franchise characters have in recent years where they're so quick to want to move on to life changing status quo movements without letting the character breathe and be who they're meant to be for any period of time. For example, I think, I think Peter Parker would agree with that. <laughs> yes. So that's for kind example, of the challenge of the whole movie. It's yeah. just like, hey, just let me be a teenager. Well, or, and well, and his whole argument is, you know, the homecoming movie was, I just want to be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. That's how it ends. And he's like, he's given an opportunity to be an Avenger. And he's like, no, I don't want to do it. I want to be local. I want to like help people in my neighborhood. Right. The very next time we see him, he's up in space fighting Thanos. <laughs> right. Then he's now he's back and he wants to take a break. I get it. 
But it's like, okay, but I'm still, we still have not seen you be truly your own hero. Mm -hmm. You're the hero being based off of everything else going on that you're being brought into. And, you know, other franchises have done the same thing. Do you remember when um, the whole Superman, Man of Steel thing where the whole, you know, trying to reimagine Superman for that DC universe and they do all this build up and they do all this origin. And then the very next movie He's lauded as a hero by the whole world and he fights Batman and, you know, all that. It's like you never saw him really just get to be a hero. You never got to see him prove himself. And I feel like from that local neighborhood standpoint, we still haven't seen that in these Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. Just we're waiting for that. There's even a scene in the trailer. It's not in the movie. Okay. Of him, like, it looks like in a mob boss meeting, webbing up guys and having banter with the police officers when they show up. Like, that wasn't even in this movie. That was like a scene that was in the trailer. And that was disappointing because it's like, that's the kind of stuff I wanted to see more of before you start shipping them off to Europe or, you know, or all this other stuff going on. So it's a little disappointing for me that that I don't really know if they know what they want to do with this character yet. They haven't quite figured it out. I do think by the end of this film, I think they have an idea what they want to do with the the character. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it plays out. Um, And I'm still wrestling with the fact that Tony Stark is basically Uncle Ben to Peter Parker, which is still not something I'm crazy about. Okay. You know, I've been positive and I'll continue. I, the ghost of Tony Stark in this film, uh, specifically, the different news reports we keep seeing and the murals on the wall. Like every time those came up, I was kind of rolling my eyes. I'm kind of done with that. And I understand in the beginning addresses addressing end game and everything. We talked about that. Okay. But then it just continues to kind of haunt the rest of the film. And I just, I was kind of getting irritated. Now that being said, kind of a double edged sword because some aspects of how, Mysterio ties into mm-hmm. the Marvel Cinematic Universe that have to do with you know certain threads of his backstory, Mysterio's backstory and origin type things. Those, in a way, I really appreciated those. Wasn't yeah. expecting Agreed. those, um, and that was that was a nice payoff. But it's something as simple as you know the murals. Yeah, it was just a little, it was a little much. It was for me. Well, and for me, my thing is, you know, I I had the same issue with Homecoming, you know, Homecoming had the wonderful scene. That's just a classic representation of the, of a classic Spider-Man scene with him being under all that rubble, almost being crushed towards the end of the film and Mm -hmm. having to lift himself out in the comics. And in kind of just 40 plus years of Spider-Man heritage, Uncle Ben and the words of Uncle Ben are what push him through that that situation got gotcha. you and instead we see tony stark in reflection in a puddle in front of him and that's like his inspiration in this movie tony stark is the inspiration for him there's a there's a great scene in the plane towards the end of the towards the latter part of the film before we get to the final sequences with between uh john favreau's happy hogan and peter parker i hate that name well, I, Happy I, Hogan. Well, it's a 1960s Marvel. I know, name. just you like Bucky with it. Captain yeah. America. Ugh. But the two of them have a dialogue that I thought was really good, and at least it brought in. It did bring in the ghost of Tony Stark, but it did it in a more <laughs> acceptable way for me. It made it more believable what impact this person could have. Okay. If I hadn't already seen the murals and the tributes and everything else, the rest of the film, that scene would have been even more impactful at that point. Agreed. But instead, it kind of got beat over the head with it Mm -hmm. by that point. So I agree. But, you know, the thing is, Uncle Ben was the guy that, you know, gave Peter this sense of responsibility because Peter Parker was kind of responsible for Uncle Ben getting murdered in the original comics and the origin story. He did not stop a burglar that he could have because he was too interested in fame and fortune. And that burglar is the one who shot his uncle. That's what drives him to be the hero. It's kind of hard for us to wrestle with what is driving him to be a hero other than I want to be like Tony Stark. <laughs> and that's not enough for me to have the emotional investment in what his he's trying to do. Well, and I think, yeah, agreed. I think it's an interesting it's an interesting take if that's what they're doing. They're yeah. basically turning Tony Stark into Uncle Ben, which, you know, interesting, a way to make it your own. I think that with me personally, the problem is I've, you know, 
by the third Iron Man movie mm-hmm. and, you know, all the press around Iron Man and Tim, Robert Downey was that he was kind of like, I'm kind of done with this. He's kind of like, you know, the third Iron Man movie, they ripped the thing out of his chest. He's like, I'm, I'm kind of done. But he continued to be around for all the Avengers movies. And I was like, dude, I thought you were kind of done. Yeah. You know, he was done. I was done. Um, and now so, the ghost still lives. And, now on the, and film, I think yeah. that's the problem is like with Uncle Ben, you understood kind of like, oh, and you didn't you didn't have all these movies with Uncle Ben being no. like thrown in your face. You just so get maybe a co- occasional remembrance when Peter's at a low point. And it's right. like, OK, I got to remember the with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and I got to remember uh, I got a, I got a responsibility to things. Right. Um, it's a little tougher the way they've set it up now. So I'm not 100 percent on board with what they've done. But I will say on a film on its own merits, I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, it is one of my more favorite Marvel films in general. Okay. I think I'd say probably top five. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, mainly so even, because, though, even though you feel unsure with how they're handling yeah. the character, it's still top If I can set five. that aside okay. and just treat it as it's true on its own merits, yeah, I had more fun with this film than I did most of the other Marvel films. Uh, it's I liked it a little better than, than Homecoming. And again, it's all because that second half, mm-hmm. Jake Gyllenhaal, pays off the really character well. he has, it pays sure. off so well. One last thing I'll say, and then... Do we want to go into quick spoilers just for a minute? I was going to ask you. Yeah, sure. I think we should. Okay. I think this is a film that kind of lends itself to a, a little discussion. A little bit of spoiler talk. Okay. Last thing I'll say before we get into that, though. Sure. I did have a huge issue with the portrayal of one character in the film, um, Sam Jackson playing Nick Fury. I thought he was pretty off and bad the whole film. Now, we get into the spoilers. Maybe I'll find some redemption for that. But... Uh, I, I just, I never felt like, you know, and I'll go into reasons and spoilers because it does hit too much, but he seemed really dumb. He seemed really impulsive. He seemed really just not the character we've seen in other films. A lot more aloof, a lot more just irritated. I don't know. It was a different Nick Fury, but again, we'll get into spoilers and that'll explain maybe, hmm. maybe why. So anyway, that, overall, I had a good time with the film. I liked it a lot. It's a lot of fun. Um, questions about what they're doing with my favorite character in the world, but that's okay. I'm trusting that, you know, they, they, they ended on a good note, and I'm really excited to see where the films go from here on out with it. Um, it sounds like you had a good time with it, too. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page. Other um, than the I- Iron Man worship. Yeah, um, the ghost of Iron Man was pretty heavily, you know, yeah. prominent in the film. But outside of that, yeah, I, I always typically enjoy the standalone films better than the ensemble pieces. And that was Good. the case here. I enjoyed it. Well, then let's go into some, some quick spoilers. Um, not going to go too heavy in spoilers. I mean, I think a couple of things are pretty obvious for anybody who might, you know, want to see the film, but we'll still take a little break. A uh, quick little moment here. I'm just going to wait. We count and, down. You, and you'll know you can come back when you hear talk of Midsummer because yeah, that'll be a This will be a very different type of film we're talking <laughs> yeah, about. <laughs> be pretty obvious. All right. So three, two, one. Okay. So as anybody who's ever read a Spider-Man comic from the past knows, Mysterio is a bad guy. Correct. And he is absolutely a bad guy here in this movie. Uh, that's the turn I'm talking about where Jake Gyllenhaal – goes into true villain mode and it's great. Mm -hmm. Um, I would agree. He's making everybody believe he's a hero for the first half of the film. And then when he finally gets what he wants from Peter Parker, which is basically access to all of Tony Stark's systems and AI and everything like that, then he turns and we find out, like you said, there's all the connections to the old original Iron Man movies where these are characters like Quentin Beck himself, the guy Mysterio that Jake Gyllenhaal plays was actually the one behind the whole hologram sequence, which was in Civil War, where Tony Stark had a, uh, a, a hologram representation of his mother and father and him having a di- dialogue. Right. Tony Stark, that's the introduction of Civil War, talking about that scene, but he also makes a very kind of offhanded comment about how kind of ridiculous the technology is. Just like wasted a bunch of money. Yeah, and he says that he even called it BARF, B-A-R-F as an acronym. Right. But then you see that Quentin Beck was the one backstage who actually helped create that. Right. So, of course, he feels very slighted. He's not with the company anymore. All this team he's assembled are former Stark employees. and Which references somebody that was tied in in the very first Iron <laughs> yeah. Man movie. Yeah. Peter Billingsley, by the right. way. Do you know that's the uh, Christmas, Christmas Story Carol guy. Kid. Yeah. yeah. Christmas Story, yeah. So that turn right away. I mean, I knew it was coming. 
I had no doubt in my mind that yeah, Mysterio is going to be the bad. He's going to be bad guy. Sure. I just you're just waiting to see when it comes out. Mm-hmm. And when it does, and he gives his kind of monologue speech on top of a bar to all of his, <laughs> it's so, it's such oh, a it's typical great. Mysterio villain thing. Sure. And then you see all the sequences of them building these holograms and sequences, which is really great. And then him himself kind of dictating what was happening in the latter half of the film. I thought all that was just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Loved it. I'd agree. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, spoiler wise, as far as, you know, basically we're going to talk about the end credit scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one, which kind of gives you a hint as to where this film could go, um, has a cameo, but it basically, you know, him and MJ are kind of hopping around New York city and, his identity is kind of thrown out to the public. Yeah. Um, and actually I think it doesn't help with your worry that they're not just letting him be spy. No. But for me, who feels like he's seen that over and over again, and okay. I'm kind of like, yeah, you're ready for something. new. And because one of the things they do kind of address with the whole blip thing, these actors are old. Um, the guy who plays Ned, which I liked him. Okay. In the first part of this movie, it was interesting. I don't know whether it's cause of the angles they had of him. He looked like he was like 45 to me. <laughs> and then as the movie went on, I guess because of wider shot, it was like, okay, he's younger. But I was like, yeah, these guys are getting, t- I can't buy Tom Holland being in high school. Like, come on. And so I think, Oh, I totally a, can. In a yeah. way, I mean, I can, but I yeah. can't. And in a way, I think them exposing it as identity is going to kind of be like Harry Potter and Hogwarts where it's like, okay guys too late. You don't get to be students anymore because you know, in that movie it was, yeah. or in that series, it was like, you know, Voldemort was out and it's like, kind oh, of forces too bad. them to grow up a yeah, little grow up. Yeah. And I think this will kind of force him it to grow be. up. And I think, although that you, know, you may lament certain aspects, I think that could be an interesting way of advancing things yeah. forward. I'm not crazy um, about the whole identity reveal. Cause again, I'm just like, come on, just give me one movie where he is <laughs> a hero in New York city, helping like local neighborhood fighting, yeah, robbers. So you just want a you just want a criminals. movie where he's just like, yeah, fighting people that are like stealing yeah. somebody's pocketbook or holding well, up a I grocery mean, store. And there are no villains. It can be like classic villains, but ones that are more street level villains and more like his style villains. But I get it. I understand what you're saying. We've already had we already had five movies before this whole Marvel thing took over of Spider Man. Right. We saw a lot of that. So I, I, I agree. I understand your your position that. You've seen it all. You want to see some new things happen with the character. And this is definitely a new thing that will happen if they live out this whole idea with the next movie. Um, You mentioned the cameo. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty amazing. And that person has been in previous Spider-Man films or no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought so. J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. He played in them in the three Sam Raimi films. Okay, that's what I thought. It was like yeah. he's been in them, but not with Tom Holland, no. right? It was like oh, a, no. a way through it back. And, you okay. know, the whole fan idea is that he was the perfect J. Jonah oh, Jameson. absolutely. So when they're talking about whenever they're going to reintroduce that character in this new universe, who could they ever get to play him that would rival J.K. <laughs> Simmons? Well, they got J.K. Simmons, Simmons to play him again. And the audience I was with just erupted. I sure. mean, it was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> so, yes, he will be playing J. Jonah Jameson as a kind of online blogger uh, Alex Jones type of character as opposed to a newspaper editor gotcha. which is good I think oh, that's a, yeah. a good interesting take on his character would agree the last little spoiler thing we'll say and it does kind of go towards that criticism I had of Nick Fury which by the end of the film I'm just like okay well that makes a little more sense we find out that the whole film Nick Fury and Maria Hill of S.H.I.E.L.D. were Scrolls, which is the shape shifting aliens from the Captain Marvel. So the whole movie, we haven't really been watching Nick Fury. We've been watching somebody playing See, Nick Fury. And I, it's interesting. So I didn't have there again. It could be because I'm not as familiar with mm. the character himself of Nick Fury. I mean, I feel like in other movies, I've seen him be kind of abrasive and brash sure. and but abrasive, but smart and abrasive. Here, he just seemed to get so frustrated so quickly with things not going his way and. No, in no universe would a Nick Fury have bought Mysterio's story, like hook, line, and sinker, like he did. Oh, you come from another dimension. Oh, and you want to help us do these things. Oh, and you're going to stop these bad guys. Cool. We will throw every resource we can your way to give you whatever you need to do this. Uh, yeah. Trust me, that is not a 
That I'll is not a smart man's. Uh, I mean, take on it, it, so. to me, it seemed natural because you just had the whole Thanos thing happen, which yeah. were people from other worlds and other dimensions, and you had Infinity Stones. So, if that stuff's believable, then yeah, this guy fighting. Well, technically, Chris, there weren't actually any other dimensions. They were just in other parts of the universe. There oh, in other parts of time multi- that you can jump back true, and forth. In. Okay, Come fine. On. All right. I, I, that to me, the the second in credit thing that you're talking about, where you, you see the revelation that Ben Mendelsohn was yeah. playing a scroll that was playing Sam Jack, I that was an eye roll for me. I, no, I, it, I, I, I liked it. I didn't like it. I liked but. it. I, well, for me, it just and again, I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to believe that give the filmmakers credit that they had that planned all along. <laughs> And not something where they got to the finishing the film, they're just like. And somebody said, "Like uh, Nick Fury, Nick Fury seems would a never off. buy that." <laughs> yeah, Nick Fury seems to be making a lot of dumb decisions in this movie. Oh, let's explain it with an end credit that he was a scroll. I hope that's not the case. I'm going to assume this was planned from the beginning, but I did think it was a little odd. I mean, yeah, it was just I, the, that end credit sequence. Although I didn't like it as much as the mid credit sequence, which we already talked about. Sure it did at least kind of smooth over one rough area of the film for me to some degree. Okay. You feel a little better about it. Interesting. So okay with that. Um, but yeah, again, we're, uh, you know, we're back on, uh, kind of wrapping this up, but again, still very positive, but I will say Jake Gyllenhaal, Mysterio, second half of the film totally worked. Loved it. Loved the reveal. Loved the tie into the old Marvel universe. And, uh, it just made the film for me. So, okay. Very curious to see where they go now. Oh, yeah, me that. too. I'm very yeah. curious. Okay, we're done with spoilers. We're done with Spider-Man. Let's go into our second review. So those of you hopefully joining us back, maybe skipping ahead on your iPod or something. Yeah, we're, we're back. And we're going to talk about the latest horror uh, drama from uh, Ari Aster. And it is Midsummer. Welcome and happy Midsummer. Skull! What time is it? 9 p.m. That can't be right. The sky is blue. This is what 9 p.m. is like here. <laughs> what is it? It has special properties. <laughs> what am I going through? We just need to acclimate. I don't want to acclimate. I want to go. We only do this every 90 years. <laughs> I was most excited for you to come. Chris, in Ari Aster's Midsummer, we uh, follow a couple that travels to Sweden to visit the rural hometown's fabled Midsummer Festival. Uh, begins as an idyllic, idyllic retreat, quickly dissolves, devolves into an increasingly violent and bizarre competition at the hands of a pagan cult. That's the description from IMDb. You know, the interesting thing with this, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts, but let me just pose it as kind of this, this opening thought here. Sure. Somebody asked me to describe this film to them. Give them like a one-sentence description of the film, the plot line, the tagline, whatever, because uh, they saw the preview and they were curious. Like, tell me, tell me just in a nutshell what this film's about. When I describe it in a nutshell, it sounds like a pretty standard horror slasher film. <laughs> Okay, just when right. you describe it, one sentence describing the film, that's pretty much what it sounds like. And it sounds like a film that's been done a lot of times before. C- young, cocky kind of Americans or, you know, kind of out of place Americans visit somewhere that they don't necessarily belong. Strange things happen. They start going missing, disappearing, all this stuff happening, weird stuff happening. You described that somebody's like, oh, yeah, I've seen that movie plenty of times. So, what is it about this film, or is there anything about this film? that sets it apart from a more conventional, typical uh, horror slash slasher film that that description may lend itself to. Well, it's interesting because in that setup, you kind of, and my answer is going to reveal what I liked most about the movie and what I liked least about it. (laughs) So um, what differentiates it Mm -hmm. from other films that have been made or other stories that have been told that follow that kind of that same trajectory, that same plot is the cinematography, the production design, the Mm -hmm. costume design and the acting that some of the acting specifically one person, uh, Florence Pugh, who plays Danny, the Mm -hmm. main character, one of the main characters in the film 
they are what set it apart. Yeah. So just the production value and the direction and the assured direction. I mean, this is only Ari Aster's second full-length feature. Hereditary from 2018 was his first. So just to, for somebody to be that assured and that skilled with only a second movie, I think that's what sets this apart. A problem for me with the film, although I liked it, and something that held it back from being from me raving about it, as I feel a lot of critics are. And I think this is very kind of a polarizing film. Either people love it or they hate it. Mm-hmm. I don't see a lot of people in between. Yeah. And I think I fall more on the more on the love it side, but I don't quite love it. And I think it's because once the up to which you know a couple, but then it's a couple, you know it's a group of Americans that go to this mm-hmm. festival in Sweden and they meet two people from London as well. But in general, it's, you know, some outsiders going, once they get to the village, I feel like even though I don't know specifics, I kind of know where the film's going. Right. And I think the fact that there weren't really any surprises for me, like I kind of thought like, I think I know the body count. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think I know like the closing scene of this movie in my head. I can kind of imagine like, yeah, this is kind of going to be where it ends up. It does end up, kind of where I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, so I guess that was a little bit of a letdown. But I still think this film is fascinating just because it takes familiar a familiar story and really kind of makes it unique. Ari Aster definitely puts another stamp on the horror genre. So uh, what's, your, what's your kind no, of I'm, I'm in total lockstep with you. I, I thought visually this was a, a fascinating film to watch. I loved everything on the production side of it. I liked everything on the acting side of it. Everything worked. I just felt like the story was fairly routine Mm -hmm. and for being in such a unique setting and with some great actors on at your disposal, I felt like the film just didn't really make take full advantage of a great story. Sure. A little bit like hereditary. I mean, to some degree, I mean, I look back at hereditary and that was a film that visually was also really, you know, interesting to watch. Played mm-hmm. a lot with shadows and darkness and other things. Every frame was just really fascinating to look at. I think Ari Aster has a great way of building mood and mm-hmm. tone in a film. Agreed. He knows how to use the visuals and the sound and the build up. Oh, yeah, I didn't tension. even mention like sound oh, design yeah. and music here. All yeah. that's perfect. Perfect. It's just the stories are just don't always hold up to what we see visually or what we experience tone wise. I thought uh, I thought Hereditary was a better story and ended uh, fine. You know, people have some in issues with the endings of, uh, of hereditary. I'm one of those, You're one of those, the tree where it takes a little bit it. of a change. Yeah. It's almost like, it's almost like midsummer. It wouldn't take much to actually tie the two films together and make midsummer almost like true. Put it a hundred years in the past and make it a prequel. There could have been some, or these some are relatives there. of that family exactly. or something. They yeah. could have certainly done that. Sure. Um, but it's just a story. I, yeah, the, I'm left at the end of the film saying, okay, yeah, that was an interesting film to watch. It was long, probably about 20 minutes longer than it needed to be. But at the end of the day, I'm yeah, like, okay. Like well, two what, hours and 47 minutes? For all, yeah, for all the visual interest that we had, I, I just don't feel like the story really gave me much to walk away with. Right. That was interesting. It pretty much followed, like you said, it followed pretty much what you expect it to be. Sure. I kind of got the feeling early in the film that the end sequence was going to be very similar to what we saw. And sure enough, it was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there wasn't a lot of surprises. Um, It makes me wonder because Ari Aster both directed and wrote both films. Sure. I think he's an amazing director. And I think any of his guidance on the production design of the film and sound design and cinematography are wonderful. I just wonder if maybe writing maybe needs to be shaped up a little bit in future productions to give something a little bit more interesting Mm -hmm. from a story, you know? Yeah. And I will say something else. We're talking about how, how it can be set apart. What makes this a little unique um, other than the things we've already mentioned. The fact that any typical horror movie to me, usually if it has like a theme or a meaning that it's trying to put out, there's usually like one. Mm-hmm, <laughs> they're not mm-hmm. usually with horror movies. They're pretty straightforward. You know, they're trying to give jump scares, trying to give gross out moments. But if there's a theme that she's like one, like, you know, teenagers shouldn't be having sex and the ones that do die or something yeah, like, you know, right. that'll be like a theme or drugs are bad or, you know, so, you know mm-hmm. something like that. Like those will be, you know, like lessons are trying to teach. But with this film, 
I feel like there were at least three themes that it was examining. And that's kind of what sets it apart in a way. There was the theme of ugly Americans. Mm -hmm. There's the theme of toxic relationships Mm -hmm. between couples, you know, and couples. And then the importance of family. Um, those themes were all kind of, oh yeah, you know, all through there. there. And they, so there's, it's trying to say little things about them, what makes a family mm-hmm. and what, what that, and so, yeah, there's just a lot more going on than, you know, Greece, which don't get Alan and I wrong. There's a lot of gruesome stuff going oh, on. In absolutely. This Lots yeah. of blood. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. And, uh, you're right. I mean, there were several themes I thought the film was going to go deeper into and it just kind of glanced over all of them. Sure. And at the end of the day, I mean, really, it's more about just, uh, you know, <laughs> the only message is I wonder if I get from the film walk away or uh, don't, don't travel to Sweden, <laughs> don't go to Sweden and don't upset your significant other. <laughs> that That's basically like if you really boil it down, that's kind of the themes I feel like you kind of carry away from, which is I know what the film is sure. really trying to say. Sure. But um, yeah, the whole family thing, I think they could have explored a little more. I think the. um the, the idea of this being a society that's very removed and unique mm-hmm. and there's a lot of questions about how often they really do have this festival and, you know, a lot of stuff I thought that you could really explore and they just didn't seem too interested in going too deep in anything. Just let's just move you from, from scene to scene to scene and get you to this end scene that we want to have. Well, that, and that, that was, was it, so, you know? Yeah, I think, and, you know, the, the focus on this community slash village with these people there, you know, you kind of have the looming feeling that they are bad stuff's going to happen because you, mm-hmm. you just kind of have the feeling that's why it's a horror movie. Yeah. Um, but with that, you know, some of the innocence of the townspeople or the way they act in a way kind of remains constant. Yes, they do some really upsetting, bad, disturbing things and, you know, their motivations behind doing them. But in a way, it's kind of I'm wondering if you feel the same way that they kind of basically the outsiders that do come there come there because of their choice. And then seemingly I was trying to nail this down in my thoughts, whether they're the ones who meet certain fates, Mm -hmm. whether or not they kind of deserve it because of what they do when they're there. Well, see, and that's kind of that whole ugly American type thing. Slasher film mentality. Oh, you did some bad things. So you got to pay the price. Well, or, or is there an understanding that, these people were going to do it anyway. Like, yeah. and that's right. a, that's, that's what I, we don't know. Right. We don't and know. also my question, you know, from that same standpoint is there's a, a sequence about midway through the film where things start to go kind of bad, where two characters from the, this community meet a certain fate. And it's at least explained why they're doing that. You're talking about the very first horrific scene. Yes. We see. Okay. Yeah. And it's explained to all the visiting Americans. This is why. Right. Everybody in the community is cool with it because they have a reason. They understand why this is happening and why, and they all feel like they're at peace with it, mm-hmm. like the community is. Right. But I don't. I didn't get any understanding of why the ending ritual sequence was happening at all. I, I think there was a passing mention of, "Well, we have to give up people, these people, to do this," but it was like not really. I don't see the community really buying into that as much as I did the two that. Oh, actually, yeah, it made I, – I totally did only because of that first instance that you're talking about. It was like that kind of set the stage. Well, but the first thing, the first thing was all about – it's all about age. It's all about hitting a certain age, and right. at a certain age, this thing happens. So what was the point of the, the, the ending? It's the culminating sacrifice that always ends the festival. Okay, so but that, again, and I, I get that. I get that that's a ritual. I get right. that that's something – but Why? Like, what is the, well, that's, you're shaking your <laughs> there head. There is no like, reason. They, exactly. Because, because. That's the thing. how I needed more understanding. If they were so meticulous to explain that middle ritual at the in the middle of the film that started off these sequences, I think and why the community was okay with it, why they understood it and they believed that there was a reason for it. I didn't see that reason for the ending other than just saying, Oh, this is just something we do. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I think it's like a sacrifice to the gods and yeah, they don't sure. explain it, but I think they're not interested in that. Well, and that's yeah. a little bit of the thing is that if, if you so. want me to believe this, this innocent, uh, there's a sense of innocence in the village. They believe everything it's, tradi- it's tradition. Yeah, that's why but, it's happening. It's always happened. And that's why it's happening. Yeah. So it, for me, that was enough. I mean, I, I, I feel like it's probably a little stuff, lazy so. and I just, if you're going to be so meticulous with explaining all the other things in this community and 
the people in the community maybe obviously do believe that they're doing the right thing or they're doing something for good. The ending doesn't really hold up for that because I didn't understand. Now, if you're going to take just the ugly Americans out because they all did something bad, okay, if that's your deal, I kind of get that. But that wasn't the case with everybody in that well, final sequence. And here's what makes – so, you know, it's like I'm analyzing this movie, although I've seen it, you know, a couple of days ago. I'm still analyzing it, which is the mark mm-hmm. of an interesting film, something we're talking about. The more I think about it, you know, whether the outsiders were brought in – for a reason or whether they were just brought there and then they met the bad faith that they did, the more I think about it, no, because if they hadn't brought in the outsiders, by tradition, so many people have to be sacrificed in the right. ceremony. You have to pull more from the rest of and the community. So they, right. And so intentionally, they bring in outsiders with the intent of, well, that way we don't have to sacrifice as many of our own community. <laughs> so, Maybe, but then no, I, that I doesn't. Totally, I totally strongly believe that. Well, so, but then the question is, okay, but all right. But if, the, yes, they, so they will just say nine. So, so they have not, and the slots are filled and some have already been filled by their community members. Right. And then, but I think what makes it kind of, and, and they, there's something we haven't addressed, which a lot of people in reviewing this film say, they'll comment on the comedy or the humor that they yeah. find in the film. Which there was and more I, of it than I expected. You know, interestingly, I guess because I'd heard before I'd gone to see the film, how some people thought there were a lot of instances of like humor in it. There was, were some, but I think it had been overplayed for me personally. Yeah. So I was expecting a lot more, but I think that's an attempt at some really dark, dark humor oh, it was, no, at it was. the end when they're in the, place where the sacrifices are going to happen and one person starts screaming. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that's some really dark humor. It's like, Oh, oh. yeah, you were buying into it until it's like, well, I mean, no all the back. humor was very dark, dark. humor yeah. and uncomfortable. Actually, You're laughing were, more from the uncomfortableness of situations. A lot of times. True. Than, yeah. One of the instances for me that I found really funny that I've never seen depicted on film before. And they, you know, just haven't. Um, and it really struck me as funny. And I don't think others in the theater were like, digging it as much as I was. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a point in the film where two of the Americans are basically facing off against each other, fighting about graduate research. I have been in situations watching other people get territorial over graduate. And I was like, that is amazing. Like it, I don't know if Ari Aster has had that experience in his life. Uh, It was like, I think maybe he has, but it was Awesome. I, I thought loved, that was really funny. I love the scene and I love the interaction between the two characters, but it also added another element to the film of, okay, what are you trying to say with this film? <laughs> I, I get it. That was a funny scene, but did, did it have any impact on the rest of the story after that point? Not really. I mean, the, there was a little bit of tension here and there, but actually I think it's pretty telling when um, one character goes to a member of the goes to his friend that brought him there. There was yeah. the Americans come there because a person from that village, um, has become their friend, but in, yeah, a Swedish in guy America, invites yeah. him there. He goes to kind of complain to him and he's like, yeah, yeah, you're okay to do whatever research. And then he kind of mentions that the other guy had already talked. He's like, wait, 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 the other guy had already talked to you. And the guy just kind of brushes it off. And that's kind of thing. Like, yeah, there's definitely some evil stuff going here. And the reason you're okay to do it is because they never plan on you leaving anyway. So, yeah, right. um, yeah. So I don't know. There was, I don't know. I, I, I liked it and I thought, no, no, I, well, and I will say as in the summary, I like the film. Sure. I, I definitely am giving it a recommendation. Uh, it, if it wasn't as visually interesting and the scene and the location and the acting and all the elements were not as good, mm-hmm. it would, it would be a pretty weak movie. But all those elements combined, you've got a really great experience. Uh, I just think it's a little long. Could have been trimmed. Uh, yeah, and I, I wish the story just had something more important to, to, to dig into than what we were given. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where I am with it. Is I just I kind of left a movie being like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, great. I watched, a, I watched a very stylish horror movie. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I guess I wanted a little bit more from something trying to be said here. And I don't, there were a lot of opportunities, a lot of places where they could have dug deeper and they just didn't. And what we're left with was a pretty simple story um, that, you know, was a lot of fun to watch though. Yeah. I think 
we're on the same page. Um, interestingly enough, I think I may have liked it a little more than you, which was not the vibe that I got when I mm-hmm. walked out of the theater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I thought that you'd liked it a lot more than me. I thought about it a lot more. Um, yeah, well, and interestingly, me thinking about it mm-hmm. more is what's made me like it more. Sitting I still back, like it. Sitting back. Oh, I'm just, I know. I'm a little just more saying, questioning of it. I'm now, saying yeah. that my questions have fallen away okay. as I right. thought about Good. it more and reflected on it more. And Good. I think um, we talked about Hereditary, his first movie, and now with this film, I feel like the story in this one is better than it was in the first one. And I think the story was interesting, a lot of ideas in the first one, but a lot of it has to do with the last 15 minutes of Hereditary basically were a dumpster fire for me. Um, Whereas this one, I feel like it was more, yeah, I can see his growth as a filmmaker and it makes me really excited for whatever film three is going to be. I'm terribly excited for whatever he does next. I mean, uh, who's the guy that did The Witch and now did The Lighthouse? Uh, Uh, Eggers. I think yes. is his name. Okay. But I can't remember. His first well, name. he's a filmmaker. I'm really excited to see. I want to see the lighthouse and I think he's got a great, the, the very similar vibe. It's like they're taking their time with their films. Visually, they're both very interesting, you know, both directors. So we've got some great filmmakers. I'm excited to see what they do next. No, this is definitely not a, it was not a drop off for me from hereditary. It just, I did like hereditary a little bit more. Um, okay. Cause I think hereditary had something more to say, even with the, kind of shift in tone in those last few minutes. It still worked for me as a story. This one visually was much more impressive. Just, I wish it had a little more to say. Robert Eggers. Was Robert the, Eggers. Yeah. Well, We've I, got some great filmmakers. I'm excited to see what they're all working on. They seem to have this, they know how to communicate dread mm-hmm. and how to communicate heavy subjects with a more traditional genre type pick. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a big fan. Can't wait to see what they do next. <laughs> Yeah, me too. I'm on the same. And just real quick, mentioning something from the film, and actually it happens in the very beginning, that kind of let me know, yeah, this is a, you know, air quotes, filmmaker making Mm -hmm. this film. Because the opening scene has these drawings on pagan doors, and then they kind of swing open to (laughs) reveal snow, and the music's going on. And then there's a series of jump cuts with a phone ringing. And just how that whole opening scene kind of, you're like, okay, yeah, this isn't your run-of-the-mill yeah. typical horror movie. You can say, yeah, this is the dude who did Hereditary. There's definitely something going on. And I think, similarly, I would say Runtime did affect it a little bit for me, but I'm looking forward to his next one. I will I will echo your comment on Florence Pugh as Danny. I thought she was really good. I have not seen her in anything else. I looked at her IMDb listing, and she's done some other parts in other films that I'm not familiar with. But she was really good. I thought she she had a, a tough role to play where she had to play damaged and vulnerable, but yet also strong mm-hmm. in balance between the two from scene to scene. Um, putting through a really tough situation while also dealing with a lot of personal demons as well. It was a it was a tough role, and I thought she did great with it. So really good. Yeah, uh, agreed. And I'll I'll say we've mentioned predictability in the film and where it ends up and kind of the final sequence in the film still being kind of predictable is where we thought it would end up. But what saved it. And I think the more I reflect on it, what um, makes me smile Mm -hmm. (laughs) is the last shot, a reaction. Somebody is reacting to the scene. Yes. And at first I was like, Whoa, wait a second. But the more I think about it, I'm like, yep, that kind of wraps up the film. It it, it worked. Okay. It worked for me as well too. Well, that's midsummer. We're both high on it. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, a few misgivings story-wise for me, but overall I still feel like a great film experience. Chris has grown in his estimation of the film in the last two days since seeing it, so yeah. that's a good sign as well. So that's our two reviews. We're going to take a quick break, and when we do, do come back from the show, we've got some news items and other things to talk about, and then we'll end up the show with our recommendations for the episode. Stay tuned. This is Foot Candle Films. We'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, North Carolina, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Jackson Creative, we tell your story. Hey, this is Andrew Moose from the Street Circle Drive podcast here on The Mesh. Interested in promoting your business to an online audience? Your ad could be right here. Consider advertising on the Mesh Podcast Network. Head over to themesh.tv for details. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the Mesh. Uh, before we get into our next sections of the show, just want to remind you you're listening to this podcast on the Mesh.tv network. That is a podcast network 
there we have uh, original content uh, for your listening pleasure. We encourage you to go check out all the shows on the Mesh website at themesh.tv where you can download and subscribe to any number of podcasts that are hosted there. Uh, we've been real excited to have some some great ongoing shows as well as a few new ones. If you're into golf, there's a great golf podcast that we just started called The Forecast. And uh, comedian John Reap, that uh, is a friend of The Mesh, also his Fried Podcast has been broadcasting from The Mesh Studios. So real excited to have all the content on The Mesh Network. Uh, we encourage you to check it out, subscribe, and uh, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your feedback. And then I guess we'll move on to some movie news here. So, Alan, Danny Boyle has come out with a film, and it's yes, <laughs> yes, he, yes has. he has. And it, you, you know, are the, the subject matter around it was interesting to me. It's all has to do with the world having amnesia about the Beatles. Um, you have seen the film yesterday. I have. Uh, why don't you share your quick thoughts on I it? I saw yesterday, day before yesterday. Yesterday, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so yesterday, uh, it, it is an interesting concept. I'm, I'm a big Danny Boyle fan. I, I generally like most all of his movies. And when I heard the concept of this film, it just shocked me that Danny Boyle was attached to be the director of this film. Okay. A struggling musician realizes he's the only person on earth who can remember the Beatles after he wakes up in an alternate timeline where they never existed. So that concept alone, fascinating. I'm like, okay, I'm kind of really curious about the film. Okay. So you see the trailer. And it looks like a light film. It's not a heavy science fiction film. It's truly like they're not interested in explaining what happened and why they're now in this alternative world. Um, I will say this. I, I had a good time with the film. I think it's a good, fun film. Danny Boyle is not the director for this film. Should not oh, be the director for this film. I, I think okay. Danny Boyle is a very visual director. He's got a lot of interesting things he tries to do with with cameras and with uh the sequencing of things in the film and, and the styles didn't match i think you needed a more traditional romantic comedy direction eye for this and i don't think danny bull has ever done a romantic comedy but that's absolutely what this film is don't hmm. get any misconceptions okay. yes it is about music yes it has something to do with the music industry but at its core it's a romantic comedy gotcha and so good date movie it is a good date movie. Okay. Absolutely. I will say on a positive side. Midsummer, probably not a good date <laughs> Not a good date movie. <laughs> um, I will say that I thought um, the lead actor, Himesh Patel, um, was was fine. Um, I think they could have done a little better with that role or with his performance. But I will say the one I, I thought was great was Lily James playing uh, Ellie Appleton, which is his manager. She was great. She she knew she was in a romantic comedy and she knew how to play this this role. And it was it was a I loved every moment she was on the on the screen. She she really nailed that performance. Okay. Um the music's great, you know, uh to hear. Although again, I don't think Danny Bull really knows how to direct a great music performance on hmm. stage. So the performances were not really exciting or interesting to watch, I didn't think. So the movie works. Just don't go in expecting it to be as high concept as what the description tells you. Got you. It truly is. He wakes up. Nobody remembers the Beatles. And you've got an hour and a half of him trying to work through how he can. You know, there were opportunities to talk about this whole idea of original music versus his music. He feels like he's copying from somebody else and kind of what that's doing to him. They glance at some of those things. They they mention some of those things briefly. But it never really sticks. In the end of the day, they're more interested in this guy and this girl and the re- re- relationship they have, which is fine. Just don't go into the movie expecting it to be high concept because they don't really seem that interested in the concept after a while. So, gotcha. Yeah. And I wish, I, you know, this is written by uh, Richard, uh, Curtis. Richard Curtis, who's written a lot of great romance and romantic comedy films. Notting Hill, I love, I think is a great, great film. Uh, he did About Time, which I think, uh, Chris, you've talked about before. Mm-hmm. Um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Love wrote, Actually. Love Actually. And from that standpoint, I thought he did a you know, The story as it's written is good. Just I think the director was a mis- mix match, mismatch. And uh, I think this is also getting marketed in a different way than it probably should be. Okay. If it was marketed more as a Love Actually and more of a Notting Hill I think uh, they would have gotten the tone a little bit better with the production. So, hmm. but overall, I had a I had a good time with it. I mean, it is fun. It's Beatles music, and uh, <laughs> there's one scene that I won't spoil, but uh, was an interesting 
interesting choice they made, um, knowing that this is an alternative timeline where the Beatles don't exist as a band doesn't mean that people don't exist that were associated with the Beatles. I'll just leave it at that. Hmm. So they made an interesting choice, um, which I thought was daring and I thought worked out okay. It was good. So okay. it's, I think the film's worth seeing. Just don't go in with super high expectations and don't get hung up on the concept too much. So gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's yesterday. Let me um, let's move on to some other news items, if we could. And Chris, what I want to do here with you is uh, something that you know I can kind of be a little hesitant to do because we are only halfway through 2019. It's a little early to be talking about awards for best performances or best films of the year. But Variety, the magazine and, and website, Variety.com, has opted to do that. So why don't we just piggyback on that and talk about their article a little bit, okay. which is 11 contenders on track for a nomination from the first half of 2019. Are that's, they? okay? Yeah, that's you. Yeah, well, I mean, I get it because a lot of times what happens is if you wait to the end of the year, anything that came out in the first half of the year often gets forgotten. Yeah. So this way you're like, okay, here are some people that we think are worthy, but may be forgotten by the end of the year because of the rush mm-hmm. that comes out in yeah. September, October, November. True. And I'll say this too. They are very clear in the article saying that these are nominations. They're not saying who's going to win. Gotcha. But they're saying, what are some films that could be in that field of nominations? Okay. And here's a little bit of the challenge with this article for us is that they mentioned specifically two films they feel like could be a contender right now for a nomination for best picture. One of them we've already talked about in this podcast. And one of them we have not seen yet because it has not come to our town. Got yet. you. Makes it a little tough. Yeah. One of them is once upon a time in Hollywood, the Tarantino film. We haven't seen it. It has not released wide. It will do July 26th. I believe I, think and I will be watching it. Probably July 26th. <laughs> yeah. um, the other one, and you're not going to like this probably, but uh, Avengers Endgame. Hmm. Listed as maybe being the one that, you know, Black Panther was nominated for Best Picture. They're saying if there's a field of six, seven, eight, nine films for Best Picture, this could be one that gets squeaked in as a nomination. Won't win, but could be a nomination. I mean, I think it's like, you know, when the Lord of the Rings series yeah. came out, you know, it's kind like, okay, of like, okay, at some point we've got to put one up because, you know, it made a lot of money. A lot of people liked it. And so, you could argue that Endgame is kind of the second half of a bigger, a bigger film project. Yeah. So I get you're it. kind of recognizing that whole sure. that whole thing. Um, but they also said, you know, may want to kind of keep an eye out for Booksmart, The Farewell, which we have not seen yet, but we've not heard yet. good things about. Toy Story 4. Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, well, I mean, best picture. Come on. It, it's just... Uh, anyway. Oh, I think it'd be up there. Either that or, I mean, or it'll just run away with the animated category. But one of the yeah, two. You well, know. No, animated, I think, yeah. It's definitely in the running for best animated. But I don't know about this. Picture. You haven't caught up with Booksmart yet? Um, I have not. I, yeah, I know you were not don't terribly see the big deal about yeah. that film. So The last one they mentioned is The Last Black Man of San Francisco, which we have not seen yet. But I know we're both anxious to see that one. Yeah. So those are the ones they say might be in conversation for best picture okay. so far, based on what we've seen as of July of this year. Okay. For director, they mentioned one Lulu Wang for the farewell. Again, haven't seen it. We're very anxious to see it. They also mentioned maybe Quentin Tarantino for Hollywood and maybe Joe Talbot for last black man of San Francisco. Yeah. Those, those sound like they're, you know, possibilities. Is there anything they're missing picture wise or director from this first half that you think ought to be in the running? Not that I can recall. offhand. I can't really think of any, well, us, Oh, yeah. Us Take for that back. both picture and director, director possibly. And yeah. writing. I can see. Yeah. yeah. Us would be the one film I feel like maybe they're missing. Now, granted, they do catch up on it a little bit when they talk about Best Actress. Oh, okay. They do mention uh, Jesse Buckley from Wild Rose, which is a film we have not seen yet. Uh, Lapita Nyong'o for Us. They do mention as possibly Best Actress. I could see that oh, nomination. Yeah. Uh, Charlize Theron for Long Shot. Didn't get to catch up with that one. Florence Pugh for Midsummer. And she was also in Fighting with My Family. Is that a film you've I, seen? I'm familiar with it, but I have not seen it. But I was thinking about seeing it. Um, but it's the one about the wrestling, kind yes. of that has the rock in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, huh. Interesting. They also mentioned uh, Aquafina for The Farewell and Emma Thompson for Late Night. Okay. So those are ones that are batting around now. And then Best Actor. Um, I mentioned this film briefly about wanting to see it. The Lighthouse. Robert Pattinson. 
mm. uh, supposedly really good in that film. Um, That's they also, Robert Eggers' new like horror film correct. with William Defoe and Robert Pattinson. They mentioned Taron Egerton for Rocket Man, which oh, I think yeah, I'm on board with it's that. Kind of a lock. That's, yeah. that's a nomination right there. Uh, Jack Rayner for Midsummer. Oh, really? Hmm. Kind of surprising, but maybe yeah, he was um, good. But yeah. Winston Duke and Us. Uh, I'm not feeling that one as much, but he was good. Good sure. in it. And then they mentioned Robert Downey Jr. for Avengers Endgame. <laughs> And we all know why. And the Tony Stark uh, tribute Ghost continues. Ghost of Tony Stark, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, let me hit these really quick. Best Supporting Actress. Um, have not seen it yet. Julia Butters for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't even know what part she plays. I don't know who she is. <laughs> so that'll be fun to see. And then uh, Zhao Shenzhen for The Farewell. Again, haven't seen that either. Uh, mentioned Margot Robbie for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, Willem Dafoe for Best Supporting Actor for The Lighthouse. Hmm. Okay. And this one, uh, I don't know if you caught up with this yet or not. Keanu Reeves for Always Be My Maybe on Netflix. <laughs> oh, have come you seen on. that? No, I have not. Okay. I, it, what's the nominate best supporting actor? Best supporting actor. Is he in it that much? No. Oh, okay. But I mean, he's in it more than, than Judy Dench was in Shakespeare uh, in Love. Fair enough. Um, he has two scenes. Okay. Back to back scenes. Okay. He's good. Oh, <laughs> I I, will say I've, I've heard he's that fun. he is the reason to see that movie. Uh, is it best? supporting actor nomination no probably not but it's a fun choice yeah if if the academy awards were having to nominate things today and said you know it's just just six months is all we're going to look at <laughs> could he squeak in a field of five maybe so maybe yeah i mean i know there's going to be other ones to knock them out later in the year but uh it's it, i have not seen the whole movie I basically just skipped to the scene. Oh, he was in. really? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the movie's gotten okay reviews. I mean, it's it's you know, very middling reviews, and I didn't have a lot of time. But I, I I'm like, you know what? Everybody's talking about his <laughs> his his his, his uh, scenes in this film, so I just fast forward to him, found him, watched the two scenes. Well, I'm like, yeah, they were funny. I feel like I've seen John Wick three, I've seen Toy Story <laughs> four. To be a Keanu 2019 completist, yeah, you I do to. need to oh, see that movie. Because this is Keanu playing Keanu. Right. <laughs> so. And he has fun with it. Okay. I mean, it's it plays every stereotype of Keanu Reeves you could imagine. <laughs> so, no, okay. I don't think you need to see the whole rest of the movie. I didn't lose anything from these scenes by not seeing the rest of the movie. If they stand on their own. You can honestly skip to that point if you're short on time and just watch the 20 minutes or so he's in the movie. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so that's um, and they also mentioned Jamie Bell for Rocket Man as possibly a supporting oh. actor, which yeah, I could yeah. see that as well. Um, overall, I think The Farewell is the film I'm really looking forward to catching up with. Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, those seem to be two that we haven't seen yet, but seem to be a lot of the buzz at the midway point. And I would add to that Last Black Man in San Francisco yeah, you're right. for me. That's another one yeah. too. Well, that one got a lot of buzz as well, uh, and even Wild Rose, I think, is another. So there's like three or four films that. At the midway point, we need to catch up with and could be some ones you hear people talking about at the end of the year. Last thing I want to do for news, and this will be some quick hits here, but I know between the two of us, we have a love-hate relationship with trailers. Yes. You typically don't like to watch a lot of trailers for films that are very highly anticipated. Right. Unless you're forced to watch them in a movie theater as they're intended to be seen on a big screen. Right. Before a film. Me, I'm a little more loose with it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I will... I will go see, a tra- I will watch a trailer online if I'm interested in the film. I view trailers as their own little art form and I like them, but I have gotten burned on trailers many, many times. Well, and I agree. I think they are an art form and everything. I just really like things to be fresh when I see them in the screen. Understood. Theater. So. And I, I don't mind being tempted and teased and, and all that, but it has burned me in the last few years. I actually have watched a trailer and got my mind in a certain point for the film and then came away from the film disappointed because of that. And I don't like that feeling. So some of them, let's mention three trailers that have just come out in the last week or so. Okay. Two of them are ones that I don't think you and I have it really any big burning desire to see. So, you know, it's not going to spoil anything for us. The third one is one that I think you and I are both very, very interested in seeing. And we both broke down and watched the trailer. <laughs> so let's start with the other two first. Sure. Uh, Disney continues their live action remakes of classic animated films. Because why not? They because seem to be making not? money. The why Lion not? King early uh, film critic review started up just this morning. Hmm. And they're all glowing. And this thing's going to make tons of money. And we're not going to hear the end of it. 
So Disney is just. Does that mean we're probably going to see it and review it for the show? Probably so. Okay. So Disney is going to keep on rolling. They're not going to stop this train. You could argue that what was the last one they did? Aladdin. Aladdin. Mm -hmm. Aladdin maybe didn't quite set the world on fire as much as they were hoping, but it still is making money for them. Right. Um, And I think Lion King is going to trash all the records. So, (laughs) okay. So Mulan is now one that's also coming out soon. Now, here's the interesting thing about Mulan. It's been a long time since I've seen the animated film. I just know Eddie Murphy voiced a dragon. Right. And guess what is missing from the trailer? Anything like that. The trailer is a very realistic film Hmm. depiction of Mulan. There's no characters. There's no like cartoony characters. There's no singing. Doesn't seem to be any CGI. Hmm. It seems very real and interesting. A little Hmm. more mature, a little more uh, of a harder take on the, on the story possibly. Hmm. Interesting. So this is actually one of the first ones where I saw the trailer. I'm like, okay, so maybe they're just going to go a different direction on this. They're going to kind of skip the songs and the talking dragon and the, <laughs> more of the comedic elements and make this a real good drama film. And plus, you know, it being uh, the culture like it is and the depiction of this time time period, I'm kind of interested in the film now. So hmm. I think the trailer for this one actually works for me because they're not just going to do a beat by beat remake of the the animated version. It seems to be a little more of a, a more sophisticated take on it. So. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I have not seen the trailer, but I imagine I will. So okay, that's, that's Mulan. Look out for it. Another one that I only watched because I actually found the the previous film to be a little better than I expected, and that's the Jumanji. So Jumanji: Welcome to the Jungle was the one that came out. I guess maybe two years ago. Um, I think so. We talked about it here. We both had a good time with it. Yeah. It was a good, fun, light film. Better than we expected. Yeah, I thought it was going to be garbage. But yeah, yeah it, was it was actually okay. Um, well, they made a sequel to it. The trailer for the sequel, it's pretty funny. I mean... What's what's the name of it? Jumanji 2. <laughs> no, it's... it's Clever. <laughs> it's Jumanji The Next Level, I believe. Ah. Yeah. Kind of still playing off the video game The video game, game idea. Sure. And it seems like the premise of this film is they once again go into a video game. Okay. But it's... Two of the previous characters, the younger kids, going back in. But now they're joined by two grandparents Mm. of one of the main characters who somehow get into the film. And they're played by Danny DeVito and Danny Glover. And (laughs) so keep in mind, the premise is they go into the the, the video game, but they're playing characters in the video game. So Mm -hmm. The Rock is a character. And then you've got um, Jack Black as a Mm -hmm. professor as one character. And then you've got the other uh, Kevin Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. So the this is where it gets confusing. Danny DeVito is in The Rock. Got you. Danny Glover is in Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. So those two are basically playing grandparents bottled inside of these cartoon or video game. And Gillian Anderson is still in this. Gillian well? Anderson seemed to be playing her same character from before. Okay. And then the other girl, young girl, is in the Jack Black. No, no, no. The uh, one of the two guys from the uh, younger guys is now the Jack Black character. We don't know what happened to the other two characters. <laughs> anyway, the trailer has some funny moments, some funny okay. lines. Could it be that we're seeing all the funny moments of the film? Sure. Uh, could it have been magic in a bottle that the first one worked and this one doesn't? Absolutely. So we'll see. Hmm. Okay. But let's talk about the one trailer that I know you and I are keen on, and that is the latest film from Ryan Johnson. He, the director of Looper, Star Wars The Last Jedi, The Brothers Bloom, Brick, and I think that's all of them? I think that's his filmography. So this would be now his fifth film? Yes. Okay. The film is Knives Out. It's a, on the surface from the trailer, seems to be very much a whodunit in kind of an Agatha Christie clue type of situation where you've got a house full of people that are all suspects of a murder. I've got to think that there's probably going to be more to it than just what we're seeing. Who knows? But an impressive cast of characters, uh, actors and actresses in the film, the style looks really interesting. The trailer looks fun. So I'm actually really excited. What was your take on it when you saw it? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it. And I, I guess I didn't want to see the trailer, but I broke down just because I couldn't help it. I mean, it's just one of those things. And I I guess I also trust Ryan Johnson that he's not going to 
I, I feel like he's not going to ruin it. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah, and I, I'm excited and I'd completely forgotten, uh, Lakeith Stanfield was going to be in this mm-hmm. movie. I mean, there's so many people in it. Chris, Chris Evans, Evans, Daniel uh, Craig, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis, which I didn't even, yeah, I think Christopher I forgot. Christopher Plummer is yeah. in it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an impressive list. It's quite the cast. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it looks interesting. It looks good. And honestly, I just recently, unfortunately, watched a movie called Murder Mystery mm-hmm. on Netflix. That would um, be the Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston film. Yes. And mm. it was... Were t- you forced to watch it or did you watch it on choice? I, I did watch it on choice. Mm. Um, I The eternal optimist in me thought, hey, a funny little comedy that looks like it's doing kind of the private eyes thing with Tim Conway and Don Knotts oh, where they're like hapless detectives and you don't take anything too seriously and it's a comedy, but yet, you know, it's a mystery type thing. I was like, Oh, okay. You know, that's a simplistic enough idea. Maybe it'll be fun. It was terrible, mm. but something that found me is I think Ryan Johnson takes that idea and is like, yeah, let me update kind of a, miss marple mystery Mm -hmm. but you know make it cool make there actually be a mystery and have fun with it and that's what it looks this will be like a good version of what i was we hope so well yeah so i'm i'm still excited to see it um we'll probably avoid other trailers i hope Mm. yeah at this point (laughs) i'm afraid that's the kind of film that could get ruined by trailers especially if you are looking at a true mystery with it right yeah i don't need to see any others i know the tone he's going for i know the style of film it's going to be I'm just ready for it to get here. So it's oh, yeah. November, I think, around mm-hmm. Thanksgiving time. Yeah, it's got a Thanksgiving release date, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So very exciting there. So three trailers, one of which we were very excited about. The other two, I just think, are interesting curiosities to keep our eyes on as we go forward. So, Chris, let's go ahead and move into the last part of our show. This is where you and I both have a recommendation to share of a film. This can be something we've just recently caught back up with or something we know is available online now uh, or whatever the, the factoring may be. If it's okay, I'll go first and then kick it over to you. Sure. Um, My film recommendation for this episode, I'm going with an anniversary um, film. So every once in a while, I'm always curious to see what films are are aging at that 10 mark, 15 year mark, 20 year mark. And, you know, just kind of recognizing those, those anniversaries. Well, as I was looking through a list and looking through my diary of films I've seen, I realized that uh, this week marks the 20th anniversary of a film that I'm going to recommend. And I'm anxious to hear your thoughts because I don't think we've talked about it in a really long time. Okay. Although I think maybe we saw it together. Really? Okay. Would that be right? We've known each I, other 20 years. Oh, yeah. Easily. Okay. Yeah. So the film is Eyes Wide Shut. We did not see it together, but it's definitely during my time okay. that we've known each All other. Right. Yeah. I can't remember who I saw it with, but I remember seeing it with somebody and getting into a big discussion about it I, afterwards. I, saw it, I remember the theater. I remember who I was with. I saw did it in you? Raleigh. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it wasn't you. Um, Eyes Wide Shut was July 16th, 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, 20 years ago. I am Stanley now going, Kubrick's last I am, film. Thank you for recommending it. Thank you for mentioning it. I am now going to have to watch it okay. ASAP. All right. Well, I, I bring it up because it actually reminded me a little bit of Midsummer to some degree. Hmm. Just because, Just because the things I, I, I remember from this film, and again, I've, I've revisited it since then recently. Um, hmm. locations are really interesting in this film. I just remember being kind of really amazed with the production design of some of the locations in the sure. film. You have both this kind of castle type place towards the latter half of the film. That's yeah. very interesting to look at. Well, it's all about a couple. It is. And it's also that it's the couple where at the end of the day, this film, well, let me give you the, for those maybe not as familiar with it. This was Stanley Kubrick's last film. Mm-hmm. Um, he is with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. There was a lot of press around when the film came out because they were a couple at the time. Sure. And, of course, they are no longer together. But at the time, this was a, the first film. Well, they did Days of Thunder together. But this is the first Far real. and away. Oh, yeah. But this film was like <laughs> them with Stanley Kubrick together. And it sure. was like a big deal. Oh, yeah. It was huge. But the storyline is it's a New York City doctor embarks on a harrowing night-long odyssey of sexual and moral discovery after his wife reveals a painful secret to him. And uh, what I think reminded me a lot of Midsummer, besides the production and just the fact that we're visiting these really interesting locations and the way they're all shot, is yeah, at the end of the day, this is a film about a relationship and a film, a relationship that's going through some turmoil and how that affects the two people and the decisions they make throughout the film. 
I remember watching the film and I was unnerved the whole film. I mean, it just kept you not sure where it was going to go. And I love that kind of film. But I will admit at the ending, um, which I remember where it takes, where the ending takes place. And I remember it going to fading to black and thinking that was, that was it. <laughs> and having to take some time to process that that was the ending of the film. And it was not at all what I expected for an ending of the film, but in hindsight and going back and revisiting, you realize it truly was always just about this relationship between uh, 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 Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and all the other things around it were just commenting on the things that were impacting their relationship. So the way it ended was the way it needed to end, and it made sense. But I know a lot of audiences were probably very disappointed in the film. It got marketed as a lot more of a a lot more of a thriller sure. than it really is. Yeah, a lot more of a sexual explosion than it really is. I mean, it obviously yes, it did have a lot of sex in it. it had a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of different uh, subject matter there, but at the end of the day, that's not what the film was about. And I think that's why maybe it didn't get quite the uh, audience reaction from it. But uh, it is twenty years old today. I liked it a lot when I saw it. Uh, it took me a while to wrestle with the ending, but I've come to terms with it, and I still think it's a great uh, a great uh, work of art in general. So. Yeah, I'm gonna gonna have to revisit. I've seen it, and I've seen it semi recently, but I definitely want to revisit it now that it's yeah, twenty years. It's the anniversary, so why I'm getting not? Getting old, man. Getting old. <laughs> All right. Well, what's your recommendation for us? So my recommendation uh, is going to be the film from 2016, or it was released here in the states in 2017, but Lady Macbeth. And plot summary on it is in 19th century rural England, a young bride who has been sold into marriage discovers an unstoppable desire within herself as she enters into an affair with a worker on her estate. Mm. Now you're saying, wait, uh, Chris, this is a period piece and you're recommending it. Something, something's not right. This doesn't sound like you. (laughs) Are you okay? Um, well, it might help you to know that the star of the film plays the Lady Macbeth character, although her name's not Macbeth. Her name is Catherine in the film, is played by one Florence Pugh. Ah. So, um, like you, you when we had walked out of Midsummer, we were both saying, oh, Florence Pugh is really good. Don't really know her from anywhere. And I thought maybe she looked a little familiar, but I was like, "Ah, yeah, I guess I don't know her either. Well, thanks to IMDb, I found out not only have I seen her before, but I thought she was really good in a film called Lady Macbeth. So I will recommend it. It is a period piece. It is dark and uh, has some disturbing image, imagery mm. in it. So like Midsummer, not for the kiddies. Yeah. But um, I do recommend it. My, my uh, log line in Letterbox, which I frequently write stuff in there, is hell hath no fury like this woman scorned. Mm. And that is... Yeah, man, she's a force. Wow. So if you liked, if you've seen Midsummer and you liked her in that, or you're just wondering who is this Florence Pugh person we're talking about, check out Lady Macbeth. Okay, that's interesting. No, I'm, I'm definitely excited to see that now. So, yeah, because I, I just, again, thought she was really good in Midsummer. I'd like to see more things that she's in. I'm glad you got a chance to catch up with that and uh, recommend it for us. So that's great. Let's uh, recap in the show. We're both uh, positive on Spider Man Far From Home. I think it's a great entry in the. Uh, superhero franchise uh we were both also high on midsummer mm-hmm. some misgivings probably a little more on my behalf but not enough for me to not say i highly recommend the film people checking it out so we got two good films that we uh, discussed today i had some generally positive things to say about yesterday although you know just i think it's important to go in with a certain type of uh, frame of mind and not expect too much from it al is doing his community service by lowering the bar for I yesterday the bar has been lowered on yesterday so, so go in and enjoy it, it for what it is i'm gonna think it's great yeah <laughs> and then uh we also talked about some uh, news items with oscar picture nominations at the midway point of the year talked about some trailers and then we had our recommendations lady Macbeth and eyes wide shut for you to check out so chris Anybody who's listened to the show has some comments, wants to tell us why we're right or wrong on anything we've said, maybe point out some other films that are not getting the buzz they should be at the midway point in 2019. Where should they send those uh, comments or thoughts to? So you can email feedback to us at info at the mesh dot TV and mention foot candle in the subject line. You can also follow us on letterbox.com or on Twitter at Chris Fry at Alan Jackson or at foot candle film. 
Um, if you're listening to the show, awesome. Please consider subscribing to us on iTunes and leaving a star rating or review to help us reach new listeners. We're also available if you use these services on Spotify or Stitcher, so you can check us out there as well. Last but not least, our Foot Candle Film Festival will be coming up September 27th through the 29th. We are going to be releasing the lineup shortly, probably towards the end of July. So be on the lookout for that. And then footcandlefilmfestival.com will be where you can go to get said lineup and also get tickets if you're going to be in Western North Carolina and would like to come visit us. Yeah, absolutely. We do encourage you to do that. And let us know if you're going to be coming to the festival uh, after listening to the show. We'd love to catch up with you and say hi. So, uh, yeah, we've got a lot going on. We've got film screenings happening through our film society for the next several months. Uh, if you are living in Western North Carolina and want to come to any of the film screenings we have going on, most of the time we have seats available for the public after our members are able to grab seats. And so we do open most screenings up to the public. You're welcome to come see us. Uh, the, footkindle.org would be the website to see for the film society and track and see what we're doing over the next few months. And then Foot Candle Film Festival will be for the festival itself. We should be announcing the films here in uh, Man, close by the time you listen to this, Probably. maybe not too, not too long after that. Mm-hmm. Probably late part of July. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody in September. All right. Well, for Foot Candle Films, this has been Alan Jackson and Chris Fry. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll look forward to talking to you next time. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Taller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Taller, visit www.carpaltaller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.